Okay, good morning everyone. How are you? Uh, in this lecture, we're going to look at the fall uh, of Adam and Eve and a very specific aspect of the fall. Um, uh, we're going to reiterate some of the things we've talked about before so we can really see in terms of the cosmos, its structure, and the intrinsic, uh, you could call it the fly in the ointment. The thing in Genesis chapter 1, chapters 1 and 2, that lets us know something isn't simply right, or that the, there is there is something in the order of things that lends itself to the fall, which is not an accident, but it seems like an intrinsic part of the creation, part of the natural world, and obviously human being at the center of that, but really the human being a kind of manifestation of something about the structure of the, the natural order that brings about the fall, right? Um, so we're going to touch again on the two, two creations, particularly the nature of mankind in its capacity to choose, in its capacity to have free will, uh, that it is a being that functions by laws that is different, that are different from any other being in the order of things. In particular, we're going to look at the condition before the fall and what's that like and the condition after the fall in relationship to these four key relationships uh, of human being. Number one is the human being has a relationship with himself psychologically. Second, we have a relationship with each other socially, in this case, man and woman. Third, we have a relationship with the earth, dominion, caretaker, etc. Uh, and then lastly, obviously, we have a relationship with God. And the, the key point I want to draw out here is the transformation in all four of those relationships from before the fall to after the fall. And in a nutshell, it can be summed up this way. Before the fall is a state of harmony, consistent with the harmony that we see in the creation itself. After the fall, in all four of those categories or all four of those relationships, we see disharmony. And the details of that disharmony matter. Most intriguingly, and, and this is not lost on the tellers of this tale or the writers of the Bible. After the fall, we really become fully human. We are what we understand ourselves are today as, uh, as what we are today, as conscious, rational beings or beings with the capacity for reason and independent thought, right? So one of the elements of the nature of the human being is that up until the human being, God is the single locus of, you could say, agency or decision, choice, will, action, right? Because everything he set in motion is under the auspices of his own laws. And mankind, because of our conscious, free will, reason, what have you, spark of reason, we have the capacity to... Um, to act under our own powers. We are our own locus of, of power, and therefore we can give ourselves our own laws. And of course, the general teaching of the Bible is that man should not or does not uh, give themselves their own laws, at least if they do, consequences ensue, right? And this is why the commandment of God becomes important, because the basic premise of the Bible is that as ingenious as human beings are, their reason is sufficiently limited that they cannot act simply under the auspices of their own volition or literally give themselves laws. That's what it means to be autonomous. When we think of autonomous, we think of independent. But what it, the type of independence that's really being Im implied by the concept of autonomy is literally giving oneself one owns, one's own rules of conduct or one's own laws for existence or for life, right? Uh, Auto meaning self and nomi meaning law. We give ourselves laws. And this is how uh, the break between God and man is manifest. And of course, the twist, the twist that we're going to look at more next class uh, and next lecture is that transgression, uh, in our transgression, there is a cost, but there is also a benefit. And we're going to look at some interpreters who have looked at that story from different perspective and reach different. They're looking clearly at the same story, but reaching very different conclusions about the value and worth of uh, 
either abiding by God's commandment or following our own lights of reason, our own judgment, and so on and so forth. The one thing we're not going to look at this week is the specific meaning of the fruit and picking the fruit and what this all really represents symbolically. It should be, uh, I have to say, patently clear at this point that this story is only intelligible uh, as uh, in symbolic terms, figurative, poetic, metaphorical terms, that to take this story literally, uh, the, the story actually indicates that it, it, it's unintelligible until you start interpreting these symbols, right? Um, and, and obviously the history of biblical interpretation has accepted the principle that there, uh, that these stories require figurative or even poetic interpretation, right? That, that's, that's not a mystery. Um, that said, uh, to say that we're not going to take the story literally does not mean we're going to gloss over what the text says. I would argue just the opposite, that taking the story figuratively means a really full understanding of what is literally being said and the specifics and the details of what's literally being said before we get to the to the bigger meaning. Okay, one thing before we get started here uh, that we're going to look at uh, to indicate the meaning of the fall before to after is simply the language the text uses. We talked about the way in which the very uh, dimensional, physical, material structure of the cosmos is literally manifest in the language. God created heaven and earth. God, heaven, earth, right, in this hierarchy. And then we saw light and dark, moon, sun and moon, day and night, and so on and so forth. So you saw hierarchy and duality, and you really see it manifest in the structure and arrangement of the language, and obviously the, the language itself. So we're going to just look for a moment in this lecture at the transformation of the language, words that are used before the fall, and uh, essentially parallel terms that are used after the fall, that now describe, excuse me, a different condition, right? Which is to say, in the beginning, a kind of utopian world, but one that's utopian precisely because we're not aware of uh, the social and moral complexity, because we're not fully conscious. Afterward, what happens? Their, their eyes become clear, they see, and in seeing, they, they, be, they are able to know. It's, it's obviously... It seems to be the case, or it just becomes apparent in looking at the story, that prior to the fall, they don't have the capacity, or rather, they, they don't engage in the act of knowing or comprehending uh, or being conscious of. They have the seed kernel of that capacity, but it's not realized until that potential is, is realized, which is to say, the actual picking of the fruit. Okay. You, so we should first say that the fall happens in the context of the cyclical transformations described in the Bible. And I'm not going to read, the, the. this is basically giving you chapters 1 through 11, which I asked you to read at this point. Uh, it's giving you the, the, the main themes and substance of what happens, subject matter, in, in each chapter, right? And the one thing you become clearly uh, aware of is that as we move forward in the Bible, we're engaging in basically the life cycles of nature. And this all starts with one word. It starts with the word Genesis or birth or origin. And it's, and it's cognate, which is also used, I think, in day six uh, or in day seven uh, of uh, the creation, which is uh, the, the narrator says, and these are the generations of heaven and earth. What is generations? It describes a cyclical process of growth and development, creation and destruction. So if you have Genesis, which is birth, you also have death. If you have a beginning, you also have an end explicitly and are, or excuse me, I should say implied uh, by the very concept of birth. So that therefore the fall really must be understood within the cycles that are being described uh, of the universe itself, and that the entire book of the Bible uh, is 
description of cyclical uh, process. And there is a kind of parallel or harmony between the cycles of nature, between day and night and the seasons and the years, and then also the cycles of human history, that they function, if not in a perfect parallel, uh, that you could say they rhyme with one another and they fit, the cycles fit within one another. And the fall is really the arch moment, the original moment in which we go from birth or genesis to the peak and then toward a decline. And so you get something like a sine curve. Now in chapters two and three, and for the rest of the Bible, what we're focusing on is no longer big cosmological or ontological questions or big theoretical philosophical questions. We're dealing with social questions. We're dealing with moral questions. We're dealing with political questions from the view of the human being, right? And the problem of the human being is the, the quote-unquote problem that's already on display in verse 1 of the entire Bible, which is duality. We saw last week that Adam and Eve, first of all, there's mankind in its archetype is not one, but two. There's male and female, right? And uh, then there's two creations of male and female, man and woman, husband and wife, and so on and so forth, right? And then, of course, within human beings, there's a divide between reason on the one hand and passion on the other, or as we say, the mind, the heart and the mind, right? Things of that sort. So we're divided between ourselves and we're divided within ourselves. And it's not apparent in chapter one just how problematic this duality is. But two, the number two is often in numero numerological uh, consideration. Numerology is just like the logic. You might even say the science of numbers, but it, it's very much deals with the symbology of numbers, the symbolic meaning. Um, so, uh, you know, one is harmony and wholeness because a single thing is harmonious with itself. But two has always, it, throughout history, coming out of the ancient world, has implied conflict. Two sides inevitably in tension with one another. You think of like Democrats and Republicans or men and women or uh, you can you can run down a whole list of oppositions, and in the very language opposition suggests uh, strife and conflict. Now that conflict is not drawn out in chapter one, but we can read back in chapters two and three and see that lurking there all along is the foreshadowing of serious conflict, and it's all summed up in these two words: heaven on the one hand and earth on the other. Because what, is, what are Adam and Eve, or what is mankind going to be made from? A touch of heaven and a touch of earth that don't mix. They're like oil and vinegar, that we always have both components indistinct or distinct from one another, and we're operating on one principle or the other at any given time, and that there's never a perfect resolution or synthesis or harmony between these, these forces in tension with one another. And so the argument here I want to make is that this very first verse of the entire Bible already foreshadows the problems that we're going to see uh, in the fall. So now what I want to start to do is again touch on the nature of human being as the, be the types of beings unfold from the very beginning, right? Because we get an evolution of complexity and sophistication and that's largely manifest in the nature of the laws by which the various types of beings function on. So here you just have the development of the creation in the, the six days and on the seventh day God rests, which becomes the explanation of the Sabbath, the day of rest. Um, so we start out with uh, inanimate things that are governed by, without going over in detail here, you just read them, uh, inanimate things governed by physical laws. Then you have things that are more complex chemical and biological laws. And then you get the human being who is not simply beholden to physical laws and can make choices. Therefore, mankind necessitates a moral law. And of course, the problem of a moral law is that it can be broken, whereas a physical law cannot. So here you see the principles of creation and we start out with things that we establish something from nothing. Then we discriminate place from non-place. We have things in discrete locations because they've been 
organized. And then you have the first things that move, like the sun and the moon, through the sky, right? And then you have things with locomotion, means meaning autonomous motion, like animals, the fish and the fowl and the cattle and the serpent and the, the, the things that creepeth upon the earth. And then you have action. And Cass uses the concept of action, and this is not unique to him, but he, he, he's one who really clarifies it. Action means something specific. Action means human life and uh, the underlying motor or spring of human life. Uh, locomotion is driven by uh, biological instinctual impulses, stimuli response, genetic, genetic predispositions. Action results from choice. And choice is an intrinsically moral category, right? Uh, and therefore action, an action taken, is one done not just simply impulsively, but under the domain of um, of morality of and and assumptions or appearances of something being good or bad to an actor, right? Um, morality, in its broadest sense, simply refers to our understanding that we the world is or we code the world, and that's a great dispute that's actually on display here in the Genesis, depending on how you want to understand the story from whose perspective. Something we'll pick up next class. Uh, morality just attributes uh, good or bad to things. Either we uh, make the attribution or the good or bad, or we identify it externally. Um, and good or bad or good and evil being distinguished from simple pleasure and pain. That's all we mean by morality here, which is human beings function on the categories of good and bad, good and evil, just and unjust, beneficial and harmful, as Aristotle says, rather than simply pleasure and pain. Which is to say, there are certain painful things that we understand as good for us, therefore we're willing to suffer the pain. And we know certainly that there are pleasurable things that turn out to be bad for us. And therefore we ref refrain from those certain pleasures under the premise that in the bigger picture, our, in our interest is going to be benefited or we are going to be benefited, so on. So that's what action means. Voluntary motion and voluntary motion, if it's not dictated by impulses or genes or hardwiring, it's dictated by moral judgments of good and bad. So this slide just, in a one sense, reiterates what we've been talking about here in the way in which different beings function by different uh, laws. I mean, if you think about John Locke and some of the founding of the United States, the theory, the, the philosophy, political philosophy that went in, moral philosophy that went in the United States, um, he believed in something called natural law, that you could discern from uh, nature uh, the moral laws by which human beings should function. You could discern from human nature the moral laws by which we should function. Um, the point is, uh, if we imagine the creation as this beautiful watch with all these gears click, clicking and clipping away harmoniously, chunking away, all in sync with one another, uh, to the cosmic tick of the universe, the, 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 the cycle of the seasons. Mankind is the one, you might say, that can deviate from the order. Because God, the, the, the last rule that God imposes on the watch is to Adam and Eve to not pick the fruit from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And of course, they have the capacity to violate the harmony of the watch. And you might see the fall as the watch kind of going haywire and bre breaking down uh, fundamentally. Because remember, this, this creation is a totality. Uh, it's very good because the entire structure is in place. Once mankind or humankind deviates, we're disrupting the entire order because we're in fixed relationship with that order. Right? It raises a perennial and profound problem where the only being in the cosmos that does not have its life spelled out for it in advance. And choice raises this problem. It, what is choice based on? How are we to decide what to do? On what basis? Reason or faith? Of course, God's commandment is essentially telling us not to uh, utilize our capacity to choose. And in a sense, it's true that he demands that we remain uh, faithful by remaining ignorant uh, to our own knowledge about our own powers of choice. And of course, that seems, you know, that seems like an inevitable uh, circumstance in which uh, mankind is going to choose and they're going to have to suffer the consequences because by our very nature, 
we, we, what we do is we, we live a voluntary life. We're going, we're going to choose. Um, so to treat this story as a simplistic one in which man does the wrong thing and our bodies are sinful and we're all, the, the story is not that simple and it does not simply condemn mankind as sinful in that way. The very concept of original sin is one derived from the story, but it, it wasn't really theologically developed until much later than this story uh, by uh, St. Augustine in the, uh, in the 4th century A.D. Uh, are you choosing if you are always following God's prohibitions and rules? That's an interesting one. Um, how do you know you really have the power to choose until you violate God's order? Are you living a distinctly human existence if you're dogmatically following the rules you have been given in advance? You've never tested them. right? You see some of the conundrums, and these are some things we're going to focus on in our next class. Conundrums must we choose in order to be fully human? I suppose all of you there listening to this video would prefer to be a human being with the power of choice. Uh, clearly, in the pre-fall uh, Adam and Eve, they are not fully human, right? They, they are, in a sense, human animals, but they don't, they're not exercising those very faculties that, say, reason, choice, consciousness, they're not exercising those very faculties that God has given us that precisely differentiates and discriminates the human being from any other animal. And I suppose none of you wants to be just any other animal. You want to be a human being or a human animal. So the question, does God, this is a, almost a heretical question, but it's really posing this type of question, the story is, does God want us to violate his edict? Now, the very asking of that question is, is rather provocative. Um, but mankind is clearly a walking conflict because of this. And, you know, this raises other questions uh, as to uh, who, who makes our history. Do we take history into our own hands through choice? Or do God or uh, nature, which is uh, God's manifestation in our world, um, does God really choose uh, our path? I've already talked about these things, but I, they need to be reiterated because now you're going to see them in a slightly different context. And I'm obviously not going to go through this whole slide here. But the key thing is whether we're looking at chapter one or chapter two version of the creation of Adam and Eve, there is a dualism fundamental to the human being. In the first one, we're made in the image of God. We are not God. An image is by nature a dualistic thing because it both is and is not the thing that it represents. And that is an intrinsic conflict. The photo both is your boyfriend or girlfriend, but is obviously it is not actually your boyfriend or girlfriend. So, and of course, we'll look at this next class, but to raise the question of image of God, well, obviously this is something to do with image of the attributes of God. It's not a visible image. God doesn't operate in time and space the way we do. To speak of an image is to misunderstand. So image is really a metaphor here. Likeness is a metaphor. And this falls back on the question of what is the nature of God. And you notice that this story does not come out and tell you that, but it implies uh, the potential nature of God by things God does. By things God does. And there's some different types of things that he does. In the second creation... The dualism is also really apparent, and of course dualism implies conflict, which is to say formed from the dust of the ground, from the earth, and given the breath of life from God, right? And the breath of life seems to signify two things. On one hand, just the animating principle. We take this clay, and we're like Dr. Frankenstein, and of course this is an image of mankind creating life himself in a godlike way, for the Frankenstein story, obviously, because... Mankind has never stopped uh, attempting to take the reins of, you could say, even reality into its own hands uh, under the premise that they can even try to do that. Um, but uh, to breathe life literally means to animate the clay. But obviously there's something then metaphorical or symbolic that it's not just being brought to life. It's a very special type of life. It's a life that has choice. It's a life that has free will. And therefore, it's a life that is conscious and can reflect on the world. It has reason, or as Aristotle would call it, logos, speech and reason. 
right? So it has always been generally understood that this breath of life wasn't simply uh, bringing to life, but also involved something like the spark of reason, the spark of consciousness, uh, and what have you. But all of this just implies the fundamental conflict, the fact that mankind is a walking conflict. And what I found so provined about this observation put in a myth, notice this is a mythic account. Think about it. It's an observ, it, it is, it is a, a, a kind of strange, funky story, right? That sounds so ridiculous and implausible. And nonetheless, embedded within it, if understood figuratively, clearly makes some important observations about the nature of the human being that are frankly, you know, accurate, right? On one hand, to, to say we're the clay, is to say we're an animal just like every other, subject to the physical laws of nature. On the other hand, the spark gives us a, a higher nature that allows us to, uh, in some way you could say, defy the simple physical laws, because we don't simply live by physical laws. So now what I'd like to do is to read uh, the before and after scenarios of the uh, uh, fall, particularly in terms of the relationships uh, spelled spelled out here that I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the lecture. And of course, to capture the substance of these relationships in the before, we have to look at the second creation of Adam and Eve, because as we've said, origins establish essence or the nature of a thing. And therefore, looking at the origin of Adam and Eve, we're going to understand uh, in that how these relationships are established through the articulation of that origin. Then we're going to go on to look at some of the language specifically and just kind of establish some of the key parallel before and after. And there's a tremendous amount of parallelism um, uh, that we will see. And, and just to give one example, um, uh, before the fall, uh, things are blessed. After the fall, things are cursed. Before the fall, God says, be fruitful and multiply. And what do we do? We're fruitful and we multiply. Afterward, uh, God says, I'm going to multiply your sorrows. And one of the sorrows that's established is you're not going to multiply in the fecund and um, robust way that you did before. Right? Let's actually go through these four really quickly and just establish the, 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 the substance of these relationships. Before the fall, I think the central psychological fact is that we do not experience shame and that therefore we're in harmony with ourselves. Shame is a very specific moral emotion. It's an emotion at root, but it ha it's the result of moral education. Shame is the awareness and feeling of guilt, but it's a kind of embarrassed guilt, right? Guilt is, you feel guilty most of the time because you got caught, and you feel guilty because other people see you. But shame is something a little more like the embarrassment and guilt one feels toward oneself because you know better, you've done something wrong, guilt comes from having transgressed, committed a, crime, a sin, a crime, a, just a, a basic wrong, could be big, small, middle, right? Um, you've done something wrong, you know it's wrong, you know you shouldn't have done it, you actually, on some part of you, you don't want to have done it, and yet you, your impulses, your passions, your desires led you to do it nonetheless. And this in illustrates a, 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 a really huge, the shame they feel in chapter 3, right, is tremendous because it means that on one hand we wanted to abide by God. We had the desire, the hope, the, the decency to want to abide. But nonetheless, there's something else in us that's conflicting that drives us to want to commit the transgression. And we're literally of two minds, right? Psychologically, we're in harmony before, you could say a oneness, and afterward we're divided. Because on one hand, we did want to keep faith with God. On the other hand, we clearly wanted to test our own powers and go on our own way. Right? So internal division is the result of this relationship from a state of harmony to a state of conflict. 
our relationship with each other. Adam and Eve are a family. They become one flesh, and one flesh could be the child that they produce, or it simply could be that the whole family is an extended blood relationship in which everybody is part of each other, right? Uh, Adam, uh, Eve, is literally made from Adam's rib. When he unites in marriage with her, he is literally reuniting with himself. He, he is fragmented, right? A piece of him is literally taken out. He's made incomplete. And then he only exists as a whole within the totality of the family, meaning wife and children. And that is really, you could say, the one flesh, because you're all blood relationships. In that sense, you're one flesh. You come from the same flesh, right? Afterward, of course... God says, I'm going to put enmity, enmity between all of your family members, between husband and wife, between parent and children. And then in chapter four, what do we see? We see enmity between brother and brother. Two, two, they have blood relationship and the one kills the other. And he say, am I, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Right? Because uh, he doesn't recognize the significance of being coming from the same mother or being the same flesh right the environment in chapter one we're in dominion uh and it says the earth is basically at our disposal to supply our needs although we could think about the types of needs adam and eve have uh, before the fall um, their needs are much more like animals than after after the fall we have things like desire for power and ambition and dominance over others that leads to all types of conflictual behaviors like war and murder and crime and things of it's not clear that they have any of those types of desires before the fall right um but in the second creation of adam and eve uh man is there to dress and to keep the garden he shifts from being in dominion like a ruler to dress and to keep to dress is like, uh, to, you know, you could say to dress a tree, like decorate a tree. He, it's, he's there to tend it and take care of it. And he is in a certain sense a servant. And if he serves the earth, then it's going to provide his, for his needs, right? And this raises the next big thing is if in both chapter one and chapter two creation stories of Adam and Eve, the earth is there, its purpose is in some basic sense to serve our needs. It is our living room, and in terms of place, it's our home, and it also provides our needs, right? And nature produces a bounty. It's not just human beings who are fruitful and multiply. It is nature itself that provides all the food uh, because he's just basically a hunter and gatherer. While there's some references to agriculture and farming uh, in chapter two before the fall, Adam really doesn't become a farmer uh, until after the fall. And you notice that after the fall, nature does no longer produces the bounty because what does God do to the ground? He curses the ground. And this sounds all magical and superstitious and whatnot. But what is, what's really being said by the Bible? Uh, the state of the earth is that it doesn't simply yield up the food that you think you need or you desire. It only yields up what you need under lots of labor, and in a sense, it's indifferent to your needs. And therefore, if you want to rest your living of, of survival from it, aka food, you're going to have to till the soil. And he says, you're going to take bread from the sweat of her, your brow, which sounds totally poetic and uh, a kind of silly at first. But if you think through what's being said, it's pretty obvious that... Uh, Adam is going to have to labor, which is to say sweat, and then he's going to produce grain, and then that grain is going to be harvested and ground and then made into flour and made into bread, and therefore the sweat, the, the bread comes from the sweat of his brow. It's quite a beautiful image, and it, it exhibits that perfect kind of clipped quality of Brodsky, where a number of, there's a whole chain of events to get from the sweat to the bread, and it's all condensed in one, and of course you can see the logic of the statement and tease those things out then obviously our relationship with god is is in fundamental sense severed we get kicked out 
Uh, we lose our immortality because we no longer have access to the tree of life, which we did have access to beforehand. And this cherubim here as described by Michelangelo or painted by Michelangelo with the flaming sword bans us from entering back into the garden and picking from eternal life. And of course, I mean, obviously this utopia of Eden is really, it's almost just a psychological project projection of human desire. We live in the world after the fall. We've always lived there. But what do we desire? To live in an Edenic condition in which we have immortality, that we're in control, and that that control and power and sustenance is guaranteed indefinitely, right? There's all, the, all the guarantees that we don't have in life exist in the garden. And, of course, we live life uh, from one day to the next with no guarantees. And what do we fantasize about? We fantasize about winning that metaphorical lottery that provides those guarantees till the day we die. Or for some people, they don't want to die. They want to live on forever, right? So our relationship with God is severed. And the most fascinating element of the Old Testament in its first five books is that significant character upon significant character, and certainly not everyone, but many of them, they strive with God, they dispute with God, they disagree with God, they violate his order. Even Noah implicitly violates God's uh, <clears throat> God's God's will, uh, e even as he's you know the second Adam and uh, presented as a very decent man. It's a natural tendency of the human being to fall away from these uh, from these edicts that God has provided. And what's the basic premise of the motivation for falling away from God's order? Because we are a special type of being, uh, with reason, with choice, with voluntary life, that's obviously profoundly distinct from any other animal, we have tremendous pride. And we have so much pride that, that we think we can be like God, and, which simply means this, that we can completely dictate the terms of our own existence and turn away from, uh, the, the, we might even just say, the idea of God as a kind of limit or boundary on what's possible and an awareness that we are what? This middle being. A little bit of heaven, a little bit of earth, but by having both, that forces us into this middle position. And of course, the moment human beings turn away from God or are blind to God or close their eyes to God, many metaphors throughout the Bible, um, we think we can ascend to the heavens like the story of uh, the Tower of Babel. Okay, so let's start from chapter 2, verse 5. Well, let's, let's start verse 4. It says, so the seven days have just been completed. These are the generations of the heaven and of the earth. And they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So somehow God creates the earth, and the earth necessitates a man as a kind of caretaker or complement to the earth. And so you see that there's a necessary relationship in the Bible established between the existence of our home planet and man. And of course, science says there's no necessary relationship between this planet Earth uh, and the existence of the human being. It's all consequent, it's all uh, circumstance or contingency or chance. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Lord God planted a garden east in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. So the Garden of Eden is not just earth, it's even a special geographical location on earth that's really the living room of mankind. It's our home. Our home is not simply where we are geographically located or a house. It's the place where our identity resides, where we fit, where we belong, where we feel in harmony with our surroundings. What's going to happen when we're exiled? We're going to be homeless. We're going to be wanderers on the earth. 
which is to say home is not about geography. Home is about a place where your identity and where you and the place you live are in harmony with one another. So what's going to happen? We're going to be in constant disharmony with between our identity and the place that we uh, inhabit. And the Lord God planted a garden. I read that. Uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's important that it's not just knowledge, it's the knowledge of good and evil. Notice something really interesting. That both of these trees are presented as pleasant to the sight and good for food. It says the tree of knowledge here is good for food, and yet there is a prohibition on picking that fruit that is good for food. Now notice the first one, it's pleasant to the sight. Now, what's the problem with pleasant to the sight? That's an appearance. It appears pleasing, but until we eat of it, we don't know whether it really is good. I mean, it looks good, but that doesn't mean anything. That's just a perception, right? So, and, and this is important because when we get to the serpent at the beginning of chapter 3, he holds out the possibility of the actuality of this fruit. And, of course, what he's telling us we have to take with great skepticism, a grain of salt. We, and and he, he's playing into our own desires, and it is fundamentally unclear the true value uh, uh, to be attributed to this fruit and whether it really is good or bad for us. And, of course, the, the beauty of the story is the answer to that question is rather equivocal and rather open-ended. So now let's skip forward to chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. He's a caretaker. He's a greenskeeper, right? He's a, he, he's, a, he's a gardener. Not exactly a farmer, right? A farmer plants things. Here he just dresses them and keeps them. He tends the plants that God has already given. He is not breeding plants. He is not trying to control them. He's just trying, you could say, to manage them. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying of every tree of the garden, uh, Thou mayst, mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day uh, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, what's he saying? He makes it sound like when the fruit is plucked, uh, it's something like a poison and it's going to kill you. It's very odd that God rhetorically needs to add the word surely, right, to provide emphasis. It's not like kind of, sort of, you're going to die. You're surely going to die. But why does an all-powerful God need to add that emphasis? Um, I mean, this sounds very much the kind of like edict, the um, threat that a parent makes to a child. If you do that, I'm definitely going to take something from you or you're definitely going to get punished with sometimes it ends up just being a threat. Right. And of course, this surely is what the serpent will will play on. And he says, you know, ye shall not surely die. Right. But that surely is is rather ambiguous. To say you won't surely die does not deny the possibility that you still won't die. There's, he just said, it's not 100% guaranteed you're going to die. You, you might die, but it's not surely, right? <clears throat> and the Lord God said, uh, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, this is a really important path. It is not good that man should be alone. So what does this say? That this man is not self-sufficient. He is not independent. He is not a true individual, right? So by his very nature, it already implies that this man is incomplete. And now we're talking about the male of the species, right? Because a female is created. Um, he is dependent on other human beings, and he is only 
he is not complete by himself, but rather only completed uh, by coupling and producing a family. And what's really being said by not being alone is that mankind is a social animal, and in particular, he, he should exist within the, and this is a kind of moral uh, imperative, he, he should right, exist within the context of a family. Right. And the premise is that this is what's going to make you happy. Right. And so what we see here in part is a just so story or an origin myth about the basis of marriage. Right. Uh, it's not good for him to be alone and I will make him a help me. Uh, or I will make a help me for him. So think about what's being said here. I think it's pretty clear that Eve's. All these dyads or binaries exist complementary. They they are they they are dependent on one another, right? Just like master is dependent on slave, but you would never say a master is equal to a slave, right? Uh, a master can't be a master without a slave. So the master is actually dependent on the slave, right? If they don't have someone who follows everything they say, then the master can't be a master. It's just a word, right? So on one hand. The binaries uh, are complements that are necessary to each other for each other's existence. On the other hand, I think it's pretty clear that uh, what's being explained here in the abstract is the origin of patriarchy, because Adam's going to become a husband who is going to, uh, in a certain sense, be dominant over his wife. She is going to take on certain roles. He's going to take on other roles, but she is there to satisfy his needs and his needs seem to dominate and this patriarchal element of this story is really parallel to the fact that we have a male god is obviously a male god a father right he's called god the father right who creates and has the creative power a creative power so magnificent that it's superior to the female uh, power to bring life into existence um, through gestation and birth and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. So what does God do first to satisfy man's needs of, uh, uh, of an acquaintance? So he's not alone. Forms animals, right? Um, you know, man's best friend. Dogs, right? What's the problem? Uh, dogs, as lovely as they are, or cattle or some other pet, they're still dogs. They're still pets. They're still animals. Right. And obviously we need something commensurate or a parallel to our own nature. We need a, a human animal. That's the only thing that's going to be. And so Adam gives names to the cattle and so forth, so forth and so on. But that's not enough. And it doesn't say that, you know, and yet God realized that the animals were not enough to satisfy uh, Adam's need for companionship. But that's what's implied. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh uh, instead, uh, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God... So what does he do to Adam? He wounds him, right? Uh, he weakens him in a sense, and he pulls something out of him that then he's going to desire to recouple with, because in recoupling, he's really just recoupling with himself. And here, again, there's a, 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 an indication of the subordinate nature of Eve, because she is simply derivative of Adam. She is literally him, she is literally him right? Just an external part of him. And the rib, rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. The, the very word woman in uh, early English and Germanic origins literally means, uh, it, can, it can mean wife man, meaning the wife of man, or it can mean out of man, woe man, like literally uh, the woman is brought out of the man. And of course, again, you see a kind of symbolic parallel of birth, right? Um, uh, a man is giving a birth to a woman, and of course... Uh, this seems to be a compensation for the fact that in the natural world, it's the other way around. And that means that women have a special power that men do not have. And there seems to be a kind of acknowledged compensation for that here. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, literally. And she, uh, 
and she shall be called wo woman, woe man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, so now this is the explanation for marriage, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave, cleave unto his wife, and they should be one flesh. Cleave is a very beautiful word. You think of a cleaver, it cuts things into two. To cleave typically means to actually separate. But in here, in this uh, usage, cleave actually means for them to come together and unite into one flesh. And what's the problem of men and women coming to unite in one flesh? They're not really one flesh. They're always two independent beings. As much as they might want to merge and harmonize, uh, th that's an impossibility, right? So what does that mean that uh, their desire to unite harmoniously uh, it is going to be a failed attempt that's going to produce conflict because it's not actually possible. So notice there's marriage here and the discussion of fathers and mothers. Well, Adam and Eve do not have conventional fathers and mothers. It's a description of marriage and yet they're not going to leave their mother or father, or they are, right? They're going to abandon God by picking the fruit, and they're going to set out on their own lights, on their own journey, at least so so they think, right? And so it's not like Adam and Eve here in chapter 2 form a family. There's no discussion of sex. Sex seems to be a product of the picking of the fruit, and there are many arguments that say that the fruit itself may be the sexual act that awakens uh, people's awareness to the world. Uh, but that is for a discussion next week. So notice they're both naked and they were not ashamed. The key psychological fact, they were naked and they were not ashamed. There is only one type of being that is naked and not ashamed, and that is just an ordinary animal, some mammal, right? Uh, and, and this lets you know all you need to know. We do not speak of horses or dogs or cows or any animal as being naked. They don't wear clothes because that's their natural state of existence. And of course they're not ashamed, right? Of course they're not ashamed because they're not conscious of even considering this. To talk about nakedness is to talk about consciousness. It's not a state of the body. It's a state of the mind. To, to be naked is to be aware that one is exposed and somehow vulnerable and that people see things that, or others see things that are not appropriate to be seen. And of course, animals don't feel shame because they don't have, they, they don't have a moral law that they can break and then feel ashamed of. So what does this mean? It means Adam and Eve are just animals here. Whatever they're doing in the state of nature, uh, excuse me, the Garden of Eden, state of nature, kind of the same thing here. Whatever they're doing is uh, they're not living a human existence. They're living an animal existence. They have certain powers that distinguish them from the other animals, but it's very clear they're not utilizing them in the distinctly human way. Uh, and, and whether those powers are just nascent or in a seed waiting to be released, it's, it's unclear because obviously Adam does na he names. He, he goes through the process of naming things, which obviously other animals can't do. But it seems like his use of language does not result in the type of awareness that we see in chapter 3 that we would characterize as a full human being. Another way to think of this story from before and after the fall is that what's really being described is just a process of maturation of human beings going from a youthful and oblivious state to an aware state. Children, when they're little, they can be naked and they feel no shame because they have no reason to for many reasons that we don't have time to go into. But obviously at a certain point, um, uh, that, that changes. And, and their, their sense of self-consciousness, self-awareness about how they present themselves and what they think of themselves becomes significant. Okay, so let's move on to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, it's in the middle for some reason, God hath said, which is of course where you're going to see it all the time, right? It's going to be 
even more a temptation. Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So the serpent, you know, he, he asks all these leading questions. Actually, he makes statements that are in the form of a question. He already knows all the answers. He knows what he's doing here. And it's a profoundly mysterious story. It is not enough to just say, oh, yeah, the serpent is the devil or Satan. There's no mention of that. There's no concept. It, it, this, this is an old enough story where the concept of Satan, as we have come to understand it, doesn't exist. It's not that the serpent doesn't represent some uh, nefarious feature, potentially. But I think if we think of it simply as Satan, it's going to close off avenues of thinking about what the serpent might actually represent. And I think the start of understanding what the serpent is, is that it's a being that creepeth upon the earth. It is close to the earth. It is closer to the earth than it is to the heaven. And yet, and yet, this is a being with the power of speech. And not only that, he's clearly more conscious, more rational than Adam and Eve are before they pick the fruit. It seems that he is a being who has picked the fruit and knows exactly what happens to you. Uh, it seems that way, because, of course, we never get any clear confirmation. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Which, of course, logically does not deny the potential of them dying. It just says not surely. You won't 100% die. It could be 95%. It could be 99 But it's not 100 Right? That's a sneaky, that's a subtle. So the snake is subtle. Subtle. And we could ask ourselves, we'll save this for next class, what does it mean that the snake is subtle and beguiling? She says later on that she was beguiled. For God doth know. So here he's appealing to her. The serpent says, For God doth know that in the day uh, ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. And the as here is like God-like. Not gods yourself, but God-like. Knowing good and evil. It seems very clear. What does it mean to be? Notice it's God's plural. There's only one God here. How do we get more than one? That's, that's an interesting question. And what are gods? Gods are beings that know good and evil. And later on in verse 6, we're going to discover that knowing good and evil is what it means to be wise. What it means to be wise. And wisdom is a certain special type of knowledge that's not like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's not logical knowledge. It's not mathematical knowledge. It's knowledge that comes from experience and involves prudential judgment and decision making. Uh, 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 it, it is necessarily the result of someone who's had a lot of experience and then also has actually learned from that experience to make prudential or uh, judgments precisely in those situations where the rules of life don't apply because the rules can't apply to all circumstances. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, even the narrator acknowledges that in chapter 2, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now look at that. Why did Adam? Adam, they both independently got this prohibition. Eve, you can see why she succumbed, because the serpent was cunning and subtle and conniving, right? But why did Adam eat? Well, is not his loyalty with his own flesh? Is not his loyalty to his wife, right? The, the, the other half of him that makes his family? Has Adam chosen the loyalty to his wife over and above his loyalty to God and his commandments? It seems so. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, how is it that God walks in the garden in the cool of the day? And you hear his voice, I don't know. But it's a very anthropomorphic God. 
In the cool of the day, it seems like the picking of the fruit happens kind of at like high noon. It's the kind of the, the brightest part of the day and that God discovers them in the afternoon while or even approaching dusk, possibly. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now, not only do they hide themselves for the first time, and that's an act of cunning, right, that they got from the serpent. Not only do they hide themselves, but for some reason God apparently is unable to see them. And they have slipped the leash of God's control to such an extent that his kind of panopticon, his all-seeingness has been thwarted because maybe he, they're no longer functioning on his rules. They're functioning on their own, their own judgment. Uh, nine. And the Lord called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? He doesn't know where they are. The father found them and doesn't know where they are. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. So he feels shame. And he says, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, that thou shalt, shouldest not eat? And the man said, of course, typical man, The woman thou gave me to be with, thou gave, gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I did eat. So this is beautiful. This sets out. There was a whole chain of events here. God creates the earth and the serpent and mankind. Then the serpent tempts Eve. Then Eve tempts her husband. And now it goes back. The husband is the one who gets confronted, and she's he's going to go, Me? My wife made me do it. And then Eve's going to go, Me? The serpent made me do it right and on down the line so they don't acknowledge their own culpability they've made a choice right but they don't accept responsibility and the for the very choice they've made they try to displace it it's so fascinating and the lord god said unto the woman what is this that thou hast done and the woman said thy serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So beguile is to like charm or mesmerize. And the question is, what was the substance of what he really said that that uh, you could say seduced her to pick the fruit? What is the object of desire that she's seduced by? Because it obviously ain't an apple or a papaya or a mango, right? This fruit is a metaphor for something, of, uh, some other type of desire. It's a symbol. Now, once the discovery has been made and God per serves as a kind of interlocutor, right? Someone commits a crime and then someone is, they're confronted by the authorities and say, what have you done? And people either fess up or they don't. We have that kind of, and now we get the punishment. Now we get the substance of the fall. Once God has determined that they have transgressed, he now has the evidence. You could say their confession, right? And the Lord God, four, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So we have this kind of ascending and descending from the serpent up to E, Adam, and the Adam back to the serpent. And now the serpent's the first one to be condemned. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and because thy seed between her between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and and thy desire shall be to thine husband and he shall rule over thee. So what's the consequence? She's not an equal. If it wasn't clear before, it's clear now that she's not an equal of her husband because she's going to be ruled, um, ruler and ruled. And of course, now we're talking about birth, right? And there's always much discussion of the relationship between picking the fruit and sex. Some type of God knowledge is gained, 
And eventually, after this, we're going to see in chapter 4 that the first thing they do is Adam knew his wife. Adam knew his wife, which is, means to have intercourse with her, which means to know what this experience is and to open up all the powers and feelings and pride that come with the sexual act. And what's, uh, what you know, so the, the sorrow is, and the sexual desire and the feeling is, is a compensation for the suffering that's going to be caused in childbirth. Uh, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. So there it's acknowledged. God says, You have been loyal to your wife's voice, or to your wife, rather than to me and my commandment. It's quite clear. He has to choose. What's the next thing that gets divided? Divided loyalties. Before, all the loyalties are harmonious with one another, but now we realize there are competing loyalties that are incongruous with one another and ultimately, therefore, in conflict. And as eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thy eat, again sorrow, uh, of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth uh, to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. So you see here that nature itself, or the fauna and flora of the earth are transformed into thorn and thistle. Now, thorn and thistle seems to be one thing. First of all, these are prickly things that are threatening, number one, uh, threaten your own preservation and your own security, but also they are not edible, right? These are not things that uh, are uh, u useful. They, they lack utility, and, it, and actually they, they threaten uh, just the opposite. They're, they're harmful as opposed to being useful. And so the only way you're going to get what you need from the earth is to become a farmer, which means you have to work. So what's being introduced here that didn't exist in the utopian garden, which is the concept of scarcity, right? The concept of scarcity. Nature, you have needs as a human being, and nature is not going to simply meet your needs because you have them. You are going to have to try, and not everyone is going to succeed. Right? <clears throat> and Adam called his wife na wife's name Eve. So this is actually the first time we see the name Eve. Uh, because she was the mother of all the living. And so the idea here is that Eve, in Hebrew, the Hebrew word means life or breath, and that therefore she is the she is the source of life of all humanity. She's the mother from which everyone else is produced. So what's interesting is she has now on earth a parallel power in a derivative way from what God God could create life out of nothing. And here she has, at least within the confines of the cycles of nature, at least the power to make life. The word create might be a little too strong. Um, but uh, she is given a, 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 something like divine power. Not divine power, but something like it, derivative of it. Rep, re, it reflects it, but it is not it. And the Lord God said, Behold, that man is become as one of us. That's just the royal we. To know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Uh, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, exiled, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword uh, turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So what does it mean to be a god? It seems to be, to be a god is to be wise and to live forever. And of course, what are the two things that human beings are thirsting after? To be wise and to have knowledge and to live forever. So we're constantly striving to be like uh, gods. 
And at verse 22, it's pretty clear that this is how uh, uh, God is to be understood by these two central as attributes. He has become, now notice, it doesn't say he's become like us. It says he has become one of us, right? And the only way he maintains a, a derivative status is by being prevented from immortality, right? And this raises all kinds of strange things about the exact nature of, of God here. Um, okay. okay, so in conclusion, I just want, want to make reference to this. We're not going to go through every last thing, uh, but it is the language of Genesis before and after the fall that really clarifies what's going on. In the beginning, things are good. Things are very good. They're fruitful. Everything on earth, including mankind, is fruitful and multiplies. It's blessed. It's sanctified. Things are created and made. Things will be destroyed. After the fall, there is dominion. There is order. Uh, there is a clear, let's put it this way, a clear understanding of what all the relationships are. Afterward, we are, we hide, we're naked, we're ashamed. We're cursed. There is enmity or a state of being in conflict with one another. Our relationships are, uh, because of that, uh, disrupted and destabilized. There is um, sorrow, birth, the process of labor. Labor and prize not only work. We think of labor like you, get, you enter labor to give birth and conception. Um, uh, labor means work, but it also means a certain type of suffering and uh, sorrow, thorn and thistle becomes a parallel to, for example, um, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we have naked and unashamed to naked and ashamed. We have uh, blessed to cursed. We have dominion to enmity. Uh, and everything seems to be disrupted here. And then lastly, I've just given you, in more general terms, some of the key transformations here from before to after the fall. We start, at, and I just mentioned a couple of significant ones, and we'll conclude. But we start out with a covenant, right? God has made a covenant with mankind here. And the word isn't used, that word covenant isn't used until Noah. He reaches a covenant with Noah. Um but a covenant is a kind of social contract or compact. It's an agreement. So there's a basic agreement between Adam and Eve and God, at least implicit, that they will follow God's one commandment and they will enjoy the benefits of the garden. Uh, he says, you will surely die if you pick this fruit. So they break the covenant. And then the question is, what does it mean for them to die? What's, what's really happened to them? Uh, they go from a state of no suffering, no scarcity of bounty, to a state of suffering. But as we've seen, this entire transformation is not simply from a better state to a worse state. It consists of demonstrable trade-offs, which depending on how you understand the story, you could say that the consequential things that were gained, like knowledge, maturity, consciousness, civilization, wisdom, right? that all these things might be worth the initial transgression. And how you feel about that says a lot about how you situate yourself within the context of this story. And I'll leave it with that.